Welcome everybody to Long Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. A new trial is underway in New Hampshire that is the stuff of nightmares. A man is accused of breaking into the home of an OnlyFans model and taking video of her while she slept. Police say Mauricio Guerrero drove from Pennsylvania to New Hampshire to the home where a woman known as Rachel lived with her mother. He allegedly broke into the house and took videos of the victim as she slept naked. It's believed Guerrero even spent time in her attic because she found food, headphones, and cups filled with urine when she searched up there. He also allegedly put a tracking device on her possessions. Rachel, who shares content on the site OnlyFans, says that she gave Guerrero her previous address so that he could send her gifts like a new television. She said she had no intention of meeting him in person. Despite that, the two did meet for at least one consensual sexual encounter before Guerrero allegedly broke into her home multiple times. On Wednesday, the prosecution and defense gave their opening statements. Take a listen. This to do is lays out his plans for when he was there and demonstrates that he is on a mission. And that list, that to-do list, is found in the section of his cell phone. It has things like go to her house, then put a tracker on her car, lock the house, find her room and her stuff and get my back, get a key copy, put microphones and stuff to hear her, log into her phone hopefully, make sure to be very careful and sneakful around her home, Remember, get her phone and open it and unblock me on everything. It also details her son's name, his date of birth, a description of where her two friends live, that she drives a white Jeep, it lists her license plate, and the name and number of Nate Wilson, the guy she had been seeing. So over the next two days, from that Monday to early Wednesday morning when he's arrested, he endeavors to complete this list. Is she welcomed? He's like, okay, great. And they have they basically have a date. You know, he stays there, he stays for a couple hours in her home. She lives in Boulder at the time. And he stays there and they engage in sexual uh, activity in the course. Um, and, and then, you know, he leaves some money and he leaves some gifts. He also, and this is interesting too, because you know, most people who are contact providers don't usually give their addresses to their clients. She does. And she does that so he can have stuff delivered to her house, which she's all for. And remember, she's really in a position of control here. She's older, she's in the business, she's young, naive, and stupid. Now I think he's a dumb person, but he acts dumb and stupidly. She's in love, and she's let him on. And, you know, to say that she's sending mixed messages, which by the way is one of the ways she describes this, she's interviewed as well. And one of the ways she describes this, well, I, you know, I guess I was sending him mixed messages. Well, that's a, that's a wildly grotesque understatement. She also describes her behavior as leading him on and messing with his head. All right, let's bring in our co-host and legal analyst, defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer, former trial attorney Terry Austin. Brian, what do you make of Guerrero's defense that she wanted to be filmed? Could we hear that in their opening statements? I thought it was interesting at first. I was like, ah, I don't know if this is really going to fly. <clears throat> you hear the prosecution's case there where Guerrero knows so much about this woman, these odd details. I, I'm not even sure if most couples know these things about them unless they're stalking the other person. But the defense's argument of you don't typically give out your address, uh, even your own comments make it suggest that you think that you may have been leading him on. It might hold more water than I initially thought. Uh, I think it's a creative argument to say that your client is quote unquote dumb, but if it works, it works. Uh, is he gonna take the stand though to kind of prove that to us or is it just the <laughs> facts? I don't know, but so far it's something. If it works, that's the question, if it works. So Brian mentioned the word stalking, which I think is interesting, Terry, because why is Mr. Guerrero facing these charges of residential burglary instead of something like stalking? Well, they could have charged the stalking because it just takes two or more actions that put someone in fear. And clearly he's in our house and he was there multiple times and she was definitely in fear. But they did the burglary because they have evidence that he broke into that house. They have the evidence that there was closing there. They knew that he was living there. So that's why I think they focused on that. The stalking might be a little more difficult because of this claim that they connected with each other. And so perhaps he wasn't technically like stalking her. So I think they picked the easiest one to try to 
convince this jury. What a disturbing case. And imagine finding this out if you're the victim. Oh my goodness. Now, all right, let's switch gears now to Nevada, where a former Dances with Wolves actor was indicted on sexual abuse charges now wants the state Supreme Court to throw out the case. Nathan Chasing Horse is facing 18 felonies. Prosecutors accused Chasing Horse of using his position as a Native American leader to create a cult and convince victims that their ancestors wanted to have sex with him. According to new court documents, Chasing Horse's attorneys say that prosecutors provided information about alleged grooming by the former actor, but that's not an element of sexual assault under the law. Instead, they say the information was prejudicial and it led the grand jury to file the charges. Chasing Horse was originally scheduled to go to trial on May 1st, but a stay was issued while his legal team filed the appeal to the state Supreme Court. We have got our hands on some new video of the so-called doomsday duo, Lori Vallow Daybell and her new husband, Chad Daybell, when they were presented with a court order demanding that she produce her two missing children. The video from January 25th, 2020 shows Lori and Chad poolside at a Hawaii resort where they had gotten married. Two of Lori's children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, had been last seen in September of 2019. Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell, had died suddenly just weeks before Lori and Chad got married. The documents from Madison County, Idaho, say that Lori has five days to safely present her 16-year-old Tylee and 7-year-old J.J., their children. When the men were presented, or the men presented Lori with the paperwork, she really had almost no reaction. Are you Tammy, Lori? Do you have any questions regarding that? Do you need something? Any, any questions? Do you have any questions for that? No? Okay. okay. All right, have a nice day. Have a nice day. All right, Lori and Chad are being charged separately in connection with the deaths of JJ and Tylee, as well as Chad's wife, Tammy. Lori's trial is wrapping up right now in Boise, Idaho. The prosecution wrapped up its case on Tuesday after calling around 60 witnesses. The defense then said it did not believe the state had proven its case, so it rested without presenting any witnesses of its own. On Wednesday, the attorneys met with the judge to talk about jury instructions. Closing arguments will be held on Thursday when the jury will get the case. Prosecutors made the case that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met at a religious conference and started an affair. The state claims that they wanted to get rid of anyone standing in the way of them being together, including Lori's two youngest children, Lori's estranged husband, and Chad's wife. They say the couple used their bizarre doomsday religious beliefs to justify, quote, removing obstacles. Lori faces charges of first-degree murder and conspiracy. Despite the media only having access to the audio from the proceedings, the judge decided that the court will live stream the jury's verdict so you can see the result of this very high profile case right here on the Long Crime Network as it happens. Let's break it down. Brian, conspiracy to commit murder for grand theft by deception. Looking at the jury instructions, do you think the jury will come back with a quick verdict? Jesse, I know the three of us would love to have a quick verdict. We can get in and out. Don't have to do the verdict watch for a long time, but I think we are in for a long jury deliberation. Because when I look at the conspiracy charges, and especially what the model jury instructions are going to be, meaning what they use as a template and what likely they're arguing about and will share with the jurors, is this idea that they can establish conspiracy by simply showing the manner is sufficient that both parties understood the agreement. They don't need to show a direct agreement or a text message or something like that. And they can also imply it by the conduct of the defendant. So like you, sh you showed there, maybe her lying on the beach in Hawaii where her children are dead and the text message between them implies their conduct. But I think it's very subjective and will take a lot for this jury to come together and say, no, this is a conspiracy or this is not. So Terry, you've been following the trial very closely. What do you expect to hear in the closing arguments? Well, I definitely think that the prosecution is going to focus first on J.J. and Tylee because that's the easier case. The case against Tammy is a little bit more difficult. But I think for J.J. and Tylee, they're going to talk about the conversations that Lori had with family and with friends about the fact that her children were dark and that they were zombies and even a conversation about death. And they're going to focus on her financial interest in their social services and social security benefits. So I think that that's how they're going to tie that all together. Tammy's going to be a little bit harder because there is no direct evidence and they're going to have to show that there were conversations between Chad and Lori on the date that Tammy died and that she bought the ring before Tammy died and that yep. she went to Hawaii. 
last thing I'll mention, as to JJ and Tylee, don't forget, there's a piece of hair on the duct tape for yep. JJ. So I think that's important. That is a strong piece of forensic evidence in this circumstantial evidence case. We'll see how it wraps up. But I'll tell you what, how about a little bit of a lighter story, right? Well, police in Oklahoma got a report of someone calling for help, and they quickly responded to a rural area. The two officers could hear the yells in the distance, but they quickly discovered that the damsel in distress wasn't even human. How's it going? It is. Now, the farmer on the property said that that goat had gotten separated from a friend and wasn't very happy about it. I make the same sound when I don't see Brian Buckmeyer. A lot of you don't know that.